Thanks, Christian. And um, once again, on behalf of the Convergence Initiative, uh, welcome all of you. And this is a, a little effort that we neuroscience students are making to reach out to non-neuroscience audience. And so as the name suggests, tonight's event is going to be the black box, and we are going to tell you what happens inside the brain. So we are going to slowly reveal the mysteries. And so as a neuroscientist, we generally ask this one question, what does the brain do? So that's the question I want to ask you today. What do you think the brain does? Anyone? Not? It processes information. What else? Um, it initiates and coordinates action and movement. Yeah, behavior. right. Behavior, actions, anyone? Something? It thinks. Things? Yeah, it does things. It stores information. It stores information, right? You remember things, you learn different things, it stores all the information. So the bottom line is you all said it, what the brain essentially does it, it does the information processing. It comes in different ways, but everything comes together in the brain, and that's how we do different activities, we learn different things, we execute different behaviors. Now, brain does the same in two different ways. One, we call it stimulation or activation, and you might have seen some old movies where, you know, there's this guy, you put some electrode, you give some electrical current, and the person behaves differently. So that's something we call activation. The another thing that the brain does, it's inhibition or inactivation. So imagine if you're doing some activity, your brain is giving some sort of stimulation, but you need to stop at some point. So the brain also commands the inhibition or stopping that particular activity. And if you talk about these two processes, it happens in different brain regions. So if this is the cartoon of a human brain. And then what you see here in different colors are different brain regions. So for example, if you look at this part, this is the front part of your brain, which is important for speech, uh, smell, concentration, problem solving, motor control. Um, if you look at the back of your head, there is this other brain region that's important for just vision. You have this other brain region that's for body awareness, other kind of activities or stimuli that you get. So the bottom line is, if you look at the brain, it's sort of modular, it has different brain regions, and individual areas, they serve specific function. So you can see coordination, it, it happens in this brain area, but not in others. So it's sort of compartmentalized. So it's complex, you know, lots of areas, lots of activities happening. Question is, how do you study them, okay? Mm -hmm. So one thing you all mentioned, you know, the brain, it's important for behavior and function. So one way you can study brain is look at function, okay? So if I'm watching somebody, just observing whether the person is, uh, I don't know, smiling or probably surprised, totally blank, this is, I don't understand this, but uh, uh, you, you, you can come to a conclusion just by observing and based on the function that you're looking at. If you go further down, and we just talked about this, so there are different brain regions. Now these brain regions has to talk together to bring a certain kind of function. So then now we can look inside the brain in, in different brain region and then study what happens. If you further go deeper into these different brain regions, now it's consisting of different types of cells. And in individual region, these cells would make a network. So you can study the brain at network level. And um, it would come down to a single cell, so all the cells that you have in the brain, maybe you can study them. And within that individual cell, you have different set of molecules based on the function that they do. So you can study the molecules. So there's separate, several ways of studying brain. You can start it all the way from behavior and go to the molecular. And people that you, you talk to, some of you have seen in the lab visit that you know people do different kind of, use different approaches. Uh, we mainly use most of this, and then we try to understand that 
what exactly brain does using this different approaches. So today I'm going to tell you about the cellular and the molecular aspect of the, of the study of the brain. And then Murray will take forward from the network to the functional aspect of it. So I'll first focus on the cellular aspect of it. And so we're gonna look at the building blocks of the brain. What are these cells? What makes the brain? Yeah. And so if you were to zoom inside and get to the point where you now start looking at different cells. So here is an image from, from a brain region where you're seeing some things in blue, which are different types of cells. In red, it's a different cell, and it, it's green, it, it's a different cell. So what are these cells? So in blue, what you see are called neurons, okay? But you also have these other types of cells. They are collectively called as glia, and they are different varieties. So for example, you see astrocytes in red, oligodendrocytes, microglia, and Schwann cell. So I'm going to tell you about all these uh, cells, what exactly they do in the brain. So let's start with the neurons. So neurons are the building block of, of the brain. And um, this is a typical neuron looks like. And so if you look at the, the structure, you can see three parts. One is this round structure, which is a cell body. Um, it has this long cable, which we call an axon. And then it has this uh, thin branches at the end, which are called the axon terminals. So a neuron, it basically sends signals. And so it, in terms of anatomy, it's very typical. The neurons, they receive the signal at this end, which is called the dendrites. That's where the message is coming in. It goes via these exons and it reaches at this end called exon terminals and then it is passed on to the next neuron or next set of neurons. So this is what a typical neuron looks like, but that's not true when you look at other neurons. Uh, they come in many varieties, uh, different kind of structure. So that's what you call a morphological heterogeneity. They basically come in different shape and sizes. Um, why? Because that morphological feature or that anatomy that you are seeing, that's what is associated with specific function. So for example, if you see this uh, particular cell, we call it a Purkinje cell. You can see that it has this very bushy kind of uh, structure and it connects to way more number of neurons in comparison to the smaller neuron that you see that's kind of found in your retina. Okay, so, so the bottom line is, they, they all don't look the same way. They come in different size and shapes. Okay. So every time people talk about neurons, um, they are special in one way, and that's because they can fire an action potential, okay? So the way neurons function, it's they have this certain kind of molecules, and I'm gonna walk, th walk you through this. They are called the voltage-dependent ion channels. Um, so first of all, let's let's talk about ions. You know, it's like basic chemistry slash uh, electronics. Where so you can have different molecules that can have certain charge, either positive or negative, right? Um, and then if you were to separate these ions in different compartments, what would happen is on one side you have more positive, on the other side you have more negative. So that will give it some kind of electrical property where the current can pass from one side to the other, right? Um, this is exactly what happens in the neurons. So the neurons have a membrane, and inside of the membrane, uh, you have certain charged ions. Outside, you have some charged ions, and that gives them a capacity to generate and pass electricity or current. So biologically speaking, um, how does this charge, it passes from one side to the other, and it just one example, it goes one way, but the flow could be in both ways. And that's what it's shown here. So if you look at a neuronal membrane, you have the small channels, which is basically a small pore. Uh, either you can close it or you can open it. So normally it's closed so that nothing can pass through it. But when you open it, 
it is special for different types of your neurons. For example, what you see in green here, these pores, they are only allowing to pass potassium ions. Uh, they only allow potassium ions to pass through. You have some special ones for sodium ions. You have some for calcium ions. You can also have some that would let different molecules to pass through. And then you can see the direction. Potassium can go out, sodium and calcium can come inside. So this ionic exchange collectively generates some kind of uh, electrical activity. And that's what you call an action potential. And if you look at biological structure, you can isolate individual of this pore and you can see in the middle there's a pore. You can uh, open it, you can close it. So let's further talk about action potential. What exactly it is, how you measure it, because that's the currency that the neuron operates by. Um, so here is just a setup, and maybe some of you got to see it today. Um, so what you see here are two cells. And uh, remember, this is something, uh, the cells that can generate some kind of current. So you can use different electrodes to measure what's the electricity passing in and out of that. And here is a whole setup. You need, you know, fancy electronics and gadget to basically measure what's in there. So when you start your experiment, it it looks something like this, okay? Where on x-axis you have time, so before you start your experiment, and then on y-axis you are going to measure membrane potential, but that essentially is what Z current passing inside that that particular neuron, okay? So. When the neuron is not sending any message, when it's not doing anything, we call it a resting potential, and that's around minus 70 millivolts. It's a, the, the neuron is not doing anything, okay? And at that time, you can see the neurons have mainly sodium and potassium channels, and so they are pretty much closed, no movement of ions going on at this point. Now imagine that the neuron is getting some signal from its neighboring neuron, and that means that it has to fire an action potential. When that happens, you can see that the sodium channels, they open up and they let sodium ions inside the neuronal, uh, inside the neuron. And what it does is, because there's more positive charge inside the neuron, it changes its uh, potential from minus 70 to plus 30 or plus 40. And this process is what we call a depolarization, okay? But the problem is this neuron, it cannot stay at higher potential for a long time because remember the neurons, they send messages via this action potential. So if the action potential stays, uh, it means that the neuron is active for a long time and sometimes you need to stop the activity that you are doing. So it's not good if the, the action potential stays at plus 40. So what immediately happens is the membrane current, it has to go back to where it was, okay? So that process we call repolarization and that happens when the potassium channels, they open and they take all the potassium ion from inside of the cell to the outside. So remember, sodium, when it goes inside, it makes the cell positive inside, and that's how you get action potential, but to bring it back down, you are taking all the positive ions and kind of uh, um, sending them back, uh, sending them outside of the neuron. <coughs> so that is how the neuron comes back to the rest. And this whole process, it's called an action potential, which involves the opening of sodium and potassium channels. Um, but the question is like, you know, why am I telling you all this thing? What does it mean? Um, so what does the action potential do? And I think it's better if you got, get like some kind of demonstration. Um, so in this video, what you're going to see, there's this one giant axon that's found in squid, okay? And that axon, it's connected to a muscle. So whenever that axon fires an action potential, you can see some kind of activity in muscle, okay? Okay, so this is a dissected squid and you can see the axons, uh, it's a long, in axon, 
that goes all the way to the muscles. If you zoom into it, this is what it looks like. You can see it's, it's very large. It almost has one millimeter of diameter. Okay. And these are a bunch of these uh, giant axons. And this person identifies one of them and he puts an electrode, there it is. And you can, you'll see what, so the moment he'll pass on the electricity via this electrode, you can start now start seeing the muscle is moving. Okay. So that's what happens when the action potential is fire, you can see a uh, firing, you can see some kind of activity. And um, here is another video where if you do it, do the same experiment the other way, and this is early 50s when these experiments were done. So the same person is now using an electrode to measure the action potential, and you can see it looks exactly what I talked about. So this is something that we measure in the laboratory routinely. Okay, so moving on. Um, now we're going to talk about what happens when a neuron fires an action potential because it's, it doesn't stay in one neuron, it has to go to the other neurons. And that process is called a neurotransmission. It's, it's basically how brain communicates. And um, in order to understand this, um, you need to um, understand this one term which is called a synapse. So if you look at the neurons, they are, they are kind of connected to each other. But if you zoom into it, they are not physically contacting each other. There's a bit of a gap in between, okay? Uh, and that gap is for this neuron to release certain chemicals. So that's what we call a chemical synapse. Um, and majority of uh, synapses in our brain, they are chemical synapses. But we also have few synapses that are electrical and the difference is now they are physically attached to each other. There, there's no gap, okay? So the, what does that mean? The action potential, it can directly go from one cell to the another, okay? But it's a bit complicated when it comes to here because there's no physical contact. So what happened in case of uh, chemical synapses? Okay, so there are different components of chemical synapse. So we're going to talk about presynapse, and this is your axon terminal, the end which is sending the message, okay? So when an action potential arrives at the presynapse, what it does is it activates this little bags which are called the vesicles, synaptic vesicles, and they're full of chemicals, we call them neurotransmitters, and whenever there's an action potential coming in, these vesicles, they dump all the neurotransmitter into this gap, which is called a synaptic cleft. And once those uh, neurotransmitters are into the, uh, the synaptic cleft, it binds to this receiving end, which we call postsynapse or the dendritic spine. And then it has special set of receptors that would get activated and this neuron will now fire an action potential. Okay. So what are the neurotransmitters? Again, remember the brain does activation and inhibition and the currency is neurotransmission. So the neurotransmitters come in two flavors. One are called the excitatory and the common ones in our brains, these are just the bunch of names, glutamate, serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine. These are all important neurotransmitters in our brain. We have the inhibitory ones, GABA, glycine, their main function is to, to do inactivation. So the bottom line is, if you have a neuron and it's connected to another neuron, if it has an excitatory neurotransmission, transmitter, then the increase of, uh, there's an increased chance of uh, firing or generating an action potential from this neuron, and that's how you carry forward a message. On a contrary, if you have an inhibitory neurotransmitter release, in that case, you have decreased chance of uh, firing an action potential, and that would eventually stop the message. Okay. So, briefly talk about the neurotransmitter receptors. Um, so, so new, here is the descending uh, neuron, and sort of the keys are the neurotransmitters. And on the receiving neuron, you have the receptors, which are sort of uh, these keyholes. So the idea is that the neurotransmitter and neurotransmitter receptors, they should behave like a lock and key, okay? It means that one key will only be able to fit inside the, the particular keyhole. 
And so that's where the specificity comes in the brain. So if you see an example here, this is what the glutamate, the chemical looks like. And if you were to look at its uh, receptor, this is what it looks like. So you can see the serotonin, the GABA, these are receptors, they all have different kind of structure, right? And so a glutamate, uh, a glutamate would be able to bind to a glutamate receptor, but not the GABA and serotonin receptor because they have a different shape. Okay. And so that's, that's how you kind of identify if glutamate binds to a receptor, then you call it a glutamate receptor. So just to put it all together for you, um, in a neuron, if a neuron fires an action potential, and that happens by activation of uh, voltage, uh, uh, activation of ion channels, that action potential reaches at this presynaptic terminal where it releases this uh, synaptic vesicles and the neurotransmitter is released into the synaptic cleft. It binds to its appropriate receptor on the <coughs> postsynaptic end, and then that message is further carried to fire an action potential. So th the take home for you is that the action potential is the key signal for all the neuronal communication happening inside the brain. Okay. But our brain doesn't have just neurons. It has this other types of cells, which are called the glial cells. And um, they come in different varieties as well. And there are four main types. So the first one, they are called Schwann cells. And um, these cells, their main function is to myelinate, which is sort of a fat structure. And so it, it, this fat structure is wrapped around your exons. And what it does is, it insulates the exons. So you all know the insulation, you know, if you, if you want to preserve heat or electricity, you need to insulate it somewhere so that it doesn't diffuse. The neurons do the same thing because they are passing electricity. Now you insulate these axons, it means that you can get faster rate of action potential. And one of the important, um, uh, one of the disease where these uh, cells are important is in multiple sclerosis where the axons sort of uh, begin to lose all the myelination around them and, and that's where the action potential doesn't reach and the message is not conveyed to the next set of neurons or muscles. Um, we have oligodendrocytes in our brain. Their role is exactly the same as Schwann cells and they also do myelination and insulation of axons. Another disease, uh, ALS or you also knew, um, you know this disease from the ice bucket challenge that happens when oligodendrocytes cannot myelinate axons. There are other cells called astrocytes. Uh, they contact uh, neurons at the synapse and their main function is to provide energy support, uh, clear all the toxic metabolites uh, from the neurons or around synapse. And um, if astrocytes don't function, then you can have stroke, epilepsy, and some of those diseases. And lastly, you have uh, microglia. These are the immune cells, sort of white blood cells of the brain. And they are important for any kind of tissue injury, any inflammation you have. So any disease that you can think of, microglia is involved. So now I'll quickly move on from this building blocks of the brain and, and just give you a little bit of perspective that why it's important for us to understand neurotransmission, what happens. And um, this is something, you know, uh, everyone knows and uh, it's, it's a very important topic in the press at least. So what happens if there's a defect in neurotransmission? So what are the ways you can have defects in neurotransmission? So you can have certain drugs which are stimulants. It means they are activating your nervous system. And you know that cocaine, ecstasy, caffeine, nicotine. I didn't categorize them legal versus non-legal. Um, <laughs> uh, you can have a central nervous system depression. They are basically, they make you calm. And you all know alcohol, um, benzodiazepines, mainly Valium. People use it to sleep well. Some of barbiturates. Uh, there are certain hallucinogens which now you know, does both of that. They are a little bit more complex. Um, and then there are recreational drugs. Um, so they all affect neurotransmission in the brain. 
and how does they do that so they all have different mechanisms but i give you an example of this so amphetamine it's a it's a recreational drug and it affects the dopamine pathway and dopamine is important in our brain for reward and mood um, so you can see here um, so here is this uh, dopamine vesicles dopamine comes to the cleft and the neuron fires okay and that dopamine it's taken back inside the cell amphetamine it looks like dopamine so what it does it now it takes space of dopamine in the vesicle and dopamine is sort of left outside in the cleft because now there's no more space inside and okay this was a little fast <laughs> dopamine into the neuronal terminal so the bottom line is the drugs that affect neurotransmission the main thing that they do they basically tip off the balance between excitation and inhibition and any behavior or any sort of abnormality that you see it happens because this balance is tipped off um, so these are about the drugs you know for medicinal or recreational purposes um, in nature it's still a very important mechanism for some of the animals to to have you know maybe a pre strategy uh, strategy or a um, sort of a predatory strategy or maybe um, the survival strategy and so i'll give you some of the examples of animals they use neurotoxins to survive um, so here is this uh, frog from the amazon rainforest it has this uh, batrachotoxin what it does it it keeps the sodium channels open and now you guys would be able to answer you know if you keep the sodium channels open the action potential it, you know it stays at the max, maximum voltage and in that case you get over excitation and you can see it, the lethal dose it almost like two uh, salt grains that itself is enough to kill uh, you know an animal of like maybe 70 kg uh the another one is a puffer fish um it's actually a delicacy in japan and they have this uh, tetrodotoxin which uh, blocks sodium channels uh, and it's 100 times stronger than cyanide mm -hmm. so you need to have a special license if you want to cook this fish otherwise you are going to kill people um they have the spider toxins uh, again blocks the potassium channels uh honeybee they also have this compound blocks the potassium calcium channels uh you have certain bacteria for example the the botulinum uh that toxin it stops the neurotransmission by affecting some of the vesicle release that happens at the synap at the at the presynaptic terminal and then of course snake toxins for example the bangaro toxin it affects the nicotine receptor which is mainly present at our muscles so that's how the snake uh, paralyzes um, um, different animals but this is all you know sort of um, defense mechanisms um and yes some of them are potent they can kill you they can leave you paralyzed all your life but then we can learn from these things and sometimes it we can use it from from for our own benefits so for example the botulinum toxin which you all know it as botox um it's it's a therapeutic because it's used for this particular disease called myasthenia gravis and also the most common one that everyone is familiar with is for plastic surgery so when you learn about neurotoxins or neurotransmission you can also come with different strategies which could be for therapeutic purposes and we are still learning about that so i'm going to end here and just to summarize uh, brain processes information neurons and glial cells are building blocks of the brain they come in different sizes and shapes uh, they do different functions neurons have uh, voltage gated channels and that's how they fire an action potential the action potential it travels to axonal terminals to release neurotransmissions where it binds to its specific receptors at the postsynaptic side and and then that neuron will again fire an action potentials if it's an excitatory neurotransmission and this balance between excitation and inhibition it's controlled by glial cells and that's what is crucial for proper brain function okay uh, so the next speaker would be marie uh but before that i can quickly take two three questions